Hey everybody, Dr. Vaccaro here. My apologies for having to miss class yesterday. Uh, we'll go ahead and pick up with some lecture material and we're gonna do a little bit of listening and maybe a little bit of mixed demos to, uh, to try and demonstrate some of the ideas that we're talking about. So we left off in our first class talking about creating the sound stage and the idea that this is effectively one of the key things that we have to do in the mix. In fact, I'll go so far as to say that I think this is really the core of our mix practice is crafting the sound stage. After that, we end up creating environmental cues and that's the vast majority of what we have to do in a mix every single day. And if when we do that in a mix, we'll, we'll end up with a tolerable, usable mix. It may not be the greatest mix in the world, but it will be an acceptable mix that we could hand off to a client and there's not anything really wrong with it. The issue um, that we run into is a lot of times people who don't spend a lot of time formally thinking about this and learning to do this create rather garish mixes and it can be a real hodgepodge. Sometimes things work out, sometimes they don't, and it's hard to know why one mix turned out so much better than another if we don't spend some time digging into this topic. So we had talked the other day about soundstage drawings and the idea of lateral stereo location. Of course, we know from our critical listening course that sound sources can be a point source, which we would effectively interpret as being very, very narrow on our soundstage, or they can be a spread stereo image. They can have some stereo width. They can occupy a portion of that lateral left to right stereo field. We also know, we talked about our stereo microphone technique and that we can use stereo microphone techniques to create interchannel time differences or interchannel level differences or both. And we talked about how um, generally interchannel time differences are going to produce a spread stereo image. They'll produce some width. To get a true point source, we would have to have no interchannel time differences. And it turns out that with a stereo microphone technique, that actually rarely happens. Almost all of our sound sources, even from our XY, midside, and bloom line, will tend to have a little bit of stereo width because of room effects. Unless we're recording in an anechoic chamber, there's still likely going to be some time of arrival differences between the two microphones, just because the sound behaves differently bouncing off the left side of the room than the right side of the room, that ends up creating some interchannel time differences. However, a circumstance where we can create a true point source is when we start out with a mono track and we're effectively just panning it back and forth left to right. We'll do that in a little bit. In that case, we're only working with interchannel amplitude differences and we can create a true point source. But the moment we add any kind of time-based effect, to that track, we've now potentially started to create some interchannel time differences and we'll get away from that perfect point source. We could say it is approaching a point source. It might be a very, very narrow sound source in our stereo field, but it's not likely to be perceived as a true point source. It'll have a little bit of stereo width. So one of the things that we talked about, probably going back to audio and theory and practice, is this concept of a pan law. When I have a track that's a mono track and I'm going to pan it back and forth, let me switch my screen over here and get mix view up in Pro Tools. So when I have a mono instrument source, maybe like this, uh, let's see, I've got an acoustic guitar track here. And no, actually, maybe we'll slide over here and do a vocal track. So let's say I've got a vocal track and I have a pan pot. What that is doing is, of course, controlling the interchannel amplitude differences between the left and right channel of the main stereo bus. In this case, it's actually doing the left and right channel of a vocal submix bus, which is then going out hard left, hard right to the main stereo bus. So forgive me for oversimplifying that. You'll see in the routing here that it's not quite going out to the channel one, two bus. It's actually going out to a submix bus, which is coming back in on this aux return and then going to channel one, two. And there's some channel processing along the way here. But I'm gonna take a moment and I'm gonna eliminate all of the time-based effects from this vocal track. And we'll listen to a true point source or what will hopefully be a true point source. She told me one day she would 
as much as she loves her black iced coffee. But I cannot wait until I am cool enough. Cause baby, I've decided I'm forever hot. So at the very end, you saw me start to spin the pan pot. Of course, I can locate that track roughly in the phantom imaging between the two speakers by controlling the interchannel amplitude differences. But one of the key things we want to remember is that when I'm hard left, I am going out unattenuated to the left channel of the two bus, of the, the main stereo bus. When I go hard right, I'm going unattenuated to the right channel. Now, if we kept those the same, when we were panned in the center, then I'd be going out the same level to the left and the right bus. In theory, I would end up twice as loud. What we would expect to see is an increase of six decibels from doubling the voltage. A doubling of voltage produces a six decibel increase. So that wouldn't be desirable. What we would find is that our balance would pretty radically change between various tracks as I panned back left and forth. We'd have to have all of our panning done before we started to do rough balances. That's not a very practical way to mix, and so from very early on, the engineers who were designing consoles and setting up the panning buses once we got to a continuous panning system realized that it was important to attenuate the signal going to the left and the right when we were in the center. So one of the questions that we have, though, is how much should we attenuate? The amount that we attenuate is called the pan law for the potentiometer. In a hardware pot, this is actually built into the potentiometer. It's an aspect of how the resistance changes as we vary the pot from one side to the other. But in software, this is defined effectively within the realm of the software. It's a preference. So we know that if we were working with a pure signal that actually had no other interactions with any sound, as is happening in the voltage domain in our console, that we would want it to be attenuated by six decibels when it's panned right in the middle. In practicality, in most real world circumstances, we never get complete constructive interference between the sound coming from the left speaker and the right speaker. Inevitably, the room effect causes there to be some amount of destructive interference happening between those two signals. So we find in a lot of real world situations, for example, in a relatively untreated room, we might find that when we take the, the identical signal, we send it from the left channel, we also send it to the right channel in the exact same amount, we actually only measure maybe a three and a half decibel increase in the room. So we might decide, well, maybe a negative three and a half decibel pan law would be the ideal for that mixing situation. The question here is what pan law is going to most reliably allow me to evaluate my sound stage while I'm mixing? in a way that translates to other real world situations. So let's take a moment and let's talk about how we could actually set this up and measure this in a real world situation. So I'm gonna take a moment here, I'm gonna switch over to this screen and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take our vocal track and to avoid any use of any panning, I am gonna go ahead and route this out directly to the two channels. So in this case, I'm gonna simplify my routing a little bit. We'll come back and clean this up, but I'm gonna go out directly to the left channel. So there's no longer a pan pot on that channel. I'm gonna route this aux to channel two, and I'm gonna set up a pre-fader send. We'll maybe come down here to And once again, let me swing this up here. I'm going to set this pre-fader so that basically what we've done is taken this audio path and effectively sent it over to the other channel. And I want to demonstrate what happens, which is when we have them both panned the same way at the same level, and we'll make our adjustment here on this pot, we're going to expect to actually see our main meter go up here. So let's start with just the original track. And what we see is in that little segment, the absolute peak that we got for that track by itself was at negative 11.2 dB full scale. 
If I play the other track, I'm going to expect that to roughly come out to be the same thing. So, there we go. Let's go ahead and take a moment now and play them both at the same time. Again, what we're going to expect is that this is going to get louder. So again, in that first segment, we got a little above the 11.1, 11.2 later in the, that segment, but let's listen to that same segment again. So we're staying in that same range. Now, I'm going to pan these both on the same channel. We're basically just going to add them together. And I'm going to expect this number to go up. Again, I'm expecting this to go up by roughly 6 dB, so I'm going to expect this to maybe hit negative 5.2, 5.3. And we're roughly in that same range. I think the reason we didn't quite get there is I do have some compression happening along the way on this um, submix and on the master fader. So I'm guessing we probably lost a little bit just from the compressors and tape simulation kicking in and taking a little bit off. But we definitely got very close to that 6 dB increase. So we know that's the theoretical maximum. However, that doesn't tell me anything about how my room is set up. What I would normally want to do is... Go back to my original routing here, output 1 and output 2, channel 1 and channel 2 rather. Now, what I would do is take my SPL meter and I would play this back through the speakers in the room, placing the SPL meter roughly in the position where my head is going to occupy, ideally, ideally at that sweet spot between the two speakers. And I'd play back the sound going directly to channel 1, and I'd get a dB SPL measurement in the room for what that translated to. And then I would bring in the second channel, play both, and see how much the actual SPL level went up in the room. In real world circumstances, it's usually going to go up by at least 3 dB. The theoretical maximum would be 6 decibels. And again, that would really only happen in an anechoic chamber, if even in under that circumstance. But we're likely going to see it go up by at least three decibels, maybe a little more. Um, I'm obviously not playing back. I've got a live microphone in the room, so I'm not playing back through my speakers right now. But having run this test in my room, I know that in my room it goes up by roughly four decibels. So in theory, my ideal pan law for working in the room that I'm in is negative four dB. In reality, that's not actually an option. Let me show you in Pro Tools how we can set this. So we can set this. I'm going to go up and I'm going to go to Settings, or Setup rather, and then I'm going to go to Session. So our pan law is actually set at the session level, not at the general Pro Tools preference level. And what I can see here under Format, we can see I'm running 44.1. Internally in my session, I'm running 32-bit floating point. Um, this material was actually tracked at 24-bit, but for practical reasons we'll talk about later, I'm running 32-bit float within the session. And down here at the very bottom, we see our pan depth. And we can see there are four available pan laws within Pro Tools. Like I said, having measured mine, it's a little over four decibels louder. So I'm choosing a negative four and a half dB pan law. In your room at home, you might find that maybe a negative three dB or negative two and a half dB pan law gives you a more accurate translation to the real world. All this really means is that when I go back to how this was set up originally, and this is going to... my Vox submix, which is 101, 102, and I have my pan pot here. When I pan 
the vocals may be over there, and I hear where that is on my soundstage as I'm mixing, when I listen to it in other environments, it's going to be at roughly the same location. What we'll find is that if our pan law isn't set appropriately, that sense of where that instrument was when we mixed it in the room will be different than what the end user might hear under normal real-world listening conditions. So, generally speaking, it is one of those things that you tend to kind of set it and leave it. This isn't something we necessarily have to be setting and playing with over and over and over again. And like I say, it ideally is contingent upon the room. Now, that said, I mentioned earlier that on a piece of hardware like a console, that's built into the actual pan potentiometer. Um, pan potentiometer, by the way, um, you should know that's an abbreviation for panoramic potentiometer. Pan pot stands for panoramic potentiometer. It's a potentiometer that allows us to control the stereo panorama, right? So a pan pot has a pan law that's built into the hardware. So for example, the Trident has a particular pan law. To be honest, I don't know off the top of my head what it is. If I had to guess, I'm going to guess it's a negative 3 dB pan law, but I would actually need to go and do a little checking on that to actually confirm that's the case. In this case, though, what's actually happening is to get my sound to map pretty closely from what I'm hearing in the room to what I will hear when I listen to it in other environments once I finish my mix, I actually want to be about negative four and a half. On a console, that would require replacing every single pan pot on the entire console. It's not practical, so for the most part, this isn't something we spend a ton of time worrying about. If the pan law isn't perfect, move on with your life. The only reason we're talking about it is because we do have the option to set this in Pro Tools to determine how we want to handle it. And when we're mixing entirely in the box, we are able to pick a pan law that's going to be most appropriate for our particular listening environment, which will allow my soundstage to translate a little more accurately. The goal, again, is to translate a bit more accurately. Um, what will happen if the pan law isn't correct is that when you listen to your mix somewhere else, the overall sound stage will seem a little wider or a little narrower than you intended, and everything within that sound stage may seem a little wider or a little narrower than you intended. So, spread stereo images, as we've talked about, can happen a couple of different ways. They could happen during production, as we talked about in music production, because we chose microphone arrays and microphone techniques that capture interchannel time differences. That would be, for example, a spaced pair, or maybe a decatree, or an ORTF, NOS, DIN, any of the hybrid or spaced pair techniques will produce interchannel time differences. And as a result, they'll produce interchannel time dif or rather, they'll produce intermic time differences, which will translate to interchannel time differences, which hopefully for the end listener in the sweet spot in the room will translate to interaural time differences. So another way that we can do this, though, is artificially. And we looked at this a little bit in uh, music production last year, but let's go ahead and listen to an example of this. We'll actually go ahead and do this. Um, the musical example we're listening to today is a former UML student named Megan Kelly. This is a song called Love Myself. This was done for 7-6 Records in the very first year that that label was operating. So this was a session that I recorded at the record company in Boston with her backing band that was playing with her that semester. And she has given me permission to use this audio, so um, that's why we're doing the demo with this today. So I'm going to create another aux track. I'm going to call this one Vox Delay, and it's abbreviated. We can't see all the letters here, but it's SS for Spread Stereo. So what I'm going to do this time is use that same bus I set up a little bit earlier, though we'll actually switch it over to be post fader. So now my fader here is determining the level that's going over here. So here is our point source. She told me one day she would love me. All right. Kick this over here. So now I've hard panned left and right these two channels so that I can use a delay plugin to produce interchannel time differences. <laughs> 
Here's my delay plugin. And when we did the demo in class the other day and we were doing some math on the board, we found that this was actually very, very, very short time of arrival differences if we had, for example, used a spaced pair to record her vocals and had her stand off to the hard left. We found that we were talking delay times likely below one millisecond, at most about 1.5, 1.6 milliseconds. So what we're going to do right now is I'm going to shorten these delay times pretty drastically. I'm going to go first to 0.1 milliseconds. So this is a very, very minimal time of arrival difference or inter-channel time difference between these two channels. So what we should expect right now is that we're going to hear Megan's voice mostly coming from the center of the stereo field. However, oh, let me make one change here so that something weird doesn't happen. Make sure we're going out the same bus so that we're getting the uh, same compression on everything. There we go, that should have us all set, and that should ensure that that audio actually reads out through both of that. I think actually in the demo I was just doing a minute ago when I ran levels, we were not getting audio through because I was patched directly to the main faders, and the outputs here on my submixes are actually where we're getting the audio for the video. So I believe we should be able to hear this. Let me test this. She told me one day she... All right, so... With any luck, you should be hearing this. It should be roughly panned in the center because we've got a very, very, very small inter-channel time difference. And the level between the two channels should be pretty closely matched. That's what we're seeing on our meters over here. So. She told me one day she would love me. So we've got, ideally, what we're likely hearing is a little bit of a light, very soft pan off to the left but she's mostly panned center, but there's a tiny little bit of stereo width that's stretching across the middle right now. Let's take this out a little bit longer. We'll take this up now to 0.4 milliseconds. She told me one day she would love me as much as she loves her. Now, with that spread, we should hear this starting to steer pretty hard off to the left. In other words, this should now have some stereo width, but it's panned off to the left. And the reason it's, of course, panned to the left is because we delayed the output to the right channel. Our output to the left channel is hard left. Our output to the right channel is hard right. And that's the channel that's delayed. Obviously, if I flip this around, I can pan her to the right with that same stereo width. She told me one day she would love me. So let's take her back to the left. Now, what I'm going to do is bump this up to 0.7 milliseconds. So again, we're going to expect that now that there's a greater inter-channel time difference, we're going to expect to hear Megan's voice going even farther to the left, and we're likely going to get a change in the width of the spread stereo image. She told me one day she would love me as much as she loves her black iced coffee. All right, let's keep going. Let's take this up to one millisecond. She told me one day she would love me as much as she loves her black iced coffee. But I cannot wait and take this up to 1.4 milliseconds. She told me one day she would love me as much as she loves her black iced coffee. But I cannot wait until I. So at that point, in all likelihood, you're now hearing Megan reaching all the way over to the left speaker. And while she may have a little bit of spread stereo that's occupying that, you would kind of likely say she's panned pretty much over to the left. But let's listen to it. I'm going to initially play it with the spread stereo image, and then I will take out the delay, and you'll hear it claps to a point source coming from the left speaker. She told me one day she would love me. She told me one day she would love me. Obviously, we got a bit of a volume difference there because I took out 
a source track. We got a little quieter, but we also heard a pretty serious change in the sound staging of that track, going from what is ostensibly a point source, because now it's really only coming from one speaker. So generally, if you're listening to this on speakers, you should be hearing it about as close to a true point source as you'll be able to in your listening environment versus something that's got some stereo spread. She told me one day she would love me as much as she loves her black eye. Now, as we keep increasing this, what we're gonna find is that her width coming off of the left channel will continually decrease, but it won't really approach a point source. Let's take this up to the, the lower side of the Haas limit. She told me one day she would love me as much as she loves her black iced coffee. And we know this is actually now an impractical level that we would have to have our microphones placed very far apart, much farther apart than we normally would for a spaced pair to create that kind of interchannel time difference with a spread stereo or with a spaced pair microphone array. In other words, we're now getting into a range where effectively what we're simulating is the very beginnings of room effects, which will also create a spread stereo image but again, we tend to perceive it as very different. We recognize rather than the sound object or the sound source having width, we start to recognize that there's a sense of space around it. Let's jump this up to nine or 10 milliseconds. She told me one day she would love me as much as she loves her black iced coffee. We're gonna go up to 20 milliseconds now. She told me one day she would love me as much as she loves her black iced coffee. Again, the effect has gotten very different than what we had when we were down in this range. She told me one day she would love me. So the thing that we want to keep in mind is in the early part of the semester when we're not dealing with creating environmental cues, the sound of space, the sound of a room around our sound objects and our mix, we're predominantly going to be working with very, very, very short delay times, typically 1.5, 1.4 milliseconds or shorter. Now, there's a perfectly valid technique, and if you, like me, heard that 20 milliseconds and you were like, oh, that sounds cool, that's a nice sound. She told me one day she would love me. It is, it's a very nice sound, but psychoacoustically, the effect of that amount of delay starts to function a little differently for us. And for me, we've crossed into the realm of environmental cues. Now, let's, while we're doing this, while we're doing a demo, let's go ahead and go out close to the Haas limit. She told me one day she would love me as much as she loves her black iced coffee. Now, we're probably teetering pretty close to the edge where some of you are starting to hear that as a distinct echo. It's no longer fusing into a single sound source. And of course, that's what happens at the upper limits of the Haas limit. These two sound sources start to disentangle themselves. They no longer fuse into a single sound source, and we're conscious of one being an echo of another. Let's go up a little bit higher to where we're definitely past the range of the Haas limit up to about 40 milliseconds. And at this point, everybody should clearly hear this as an echo. In other words, what we're now hearing, maybe if we were to abstract this a little bit, we're hearing Megan stand over to our left and we're hearing a wall on the right that's creating a reflection. She told me one day she would love me as much as she loves her black iced coffee. Again, we're now definitely into the realm where this is starting to create environmental cues. If we go out farther than that, we, we've now kind of crossed into the range of what we sometimes call a slapback echo. She told me one day she would love me. And of course, as we'll talk about when we get to talking about environmental cues, early on, these kind of slapback echoes were created literally by having the singer sing in a room that had a hard reflection. The microphone picked up the direct sound and the reflection that came back a certain amount of time later. And 
that turned out to be a really important sound. In particular, there's certain genres like rockabilly, where slap back on the vocals is almost a given. So one of those things that we want to have in our toolkit, we want to have in our bag of tricks, but right now we're focusing on soundstage crafting where we're dealing with just the sound sources, not the environmental cues yet. And so, like I say, we're going to be down in this range where that's about the limit of what we're going to do, because by that point, we've got a sound object that's off to the left. It's got some stereo width to it. She told me one day she would love me. And it's a very different effect than if I had my point source panned a little soft off to the left. She told me one day she would love me as much as she loves her black iced coffee. All right. So that starts to give us a sense of what we're going to be working with this semester. Generally, for our first few mixes, the focus is going to be working with mono tracks working with stereo tracks, which we're going to generally keep panned hard left and right, and we're going to respect the stereo imaging that the tracking engineer created. And finally, we're going to take some mono tracks and we're going to use this spread stereo imaging trick to create the impression that that track had been recorded with a uh, spaced pair rather than with a single microphone source as a mono track. A couple other things we want to think about. If you recall from Dr. Moylan's text, he mentions that the realm, the range frequency range in which interaural amplitude differences predominate versus where interaural time differences predominate actually are two different frequency ranges with a little bit of overlap in the middle. In other words, what we find is that above about 13, 1400 hertz, Interaural amplitude differences tend to predominate. The wavelengths at that point are so short that our head provides a pretty serious acoustic barrier, so the sound will be louder in one ear than the other. Below about 800 hertz, we start to get into a range where basically the interaural, amp or interaural time differences predominate because the wavelengths are long enough relative to the size of our head that the sound basically envelops our head and we don't get a huge loudness difference between the left and the right ear. And then we have this range in the middle where both happen. So one of the things that we might think about while using this technique is these interchannel time differences are going to be most effective in the mid uppers and down rather than necessarily in the high range. So one of the tricks we'll often do is we'll throw a low pass filter on that delay. She told me one day she would love me as much as she loves her black iced coffee. But I cannot wait until I so one of the advantages of that is with these short delay times, it tends to mitigate any effect that we might notice as we start to push um, the delay times out into the range where we might start to hear a little bit of flamming. Um, and incidentally, we talked about the, the Haas limit being roughly four to five milliseconds out to about 30, 35 milliseconds. The reason there's a little bit of fuzziness there is because sounds with very, very aggressive transient content, we tend to start recognizing that flamming effect at a short shorter delay time than we do with sounds that don't have a rapid attack and decay portion at the onset of the sound. So basically by taking a little bit of that out, we kind of give ourselves a, a focal point um, in the frequency range where this is going to actually be most effective for us. So one of the things we do want to think about, and I'm going to switch back over to my Pro Tools screen so that you can see this here. Basically, this is the setup I've been working with. So I have my two channels. They're panned hard left and hard right. And this is my delay that I've been adjusting. Here's the high pass or low pass frequency um, that I've got set up built into the delay. Here's my delay time. What I want to show you is something I demoed in class the other day, but now's a good time to hear it, not with pink noise, but with real content. What happens if I soft pan these tracks? And for this, because we want to maximize the impact of the comb filtering, we want to really hear what this is going to do to our sound. I'm going to soft pan those, and then we're going to listen back to them. She told me one day she would love me. 
as much as she loves her black iced coffee. But I cannot wait until I am cool enough, cause baby I've decided. So we can really hear there's some timbral artifacts there, and that is the classic comb filtering effect that we get when we have two sounds that are ever so slightly delayed. What ends up happening is some frequencies constructively interfere and we end up with those frequencies louder than they should have been. Other frequencies destructively interfere and those we end up with less of that frequency. And because that happens across the frequency bandwidth, basically what we end up with is that classic comb filtering effect. In fact, let me see if I can take a moment and I'll try and set this up so that we can actually get the effect of this. This is going to take me a moment to set up because I have to do something a little tricky to get a meter that will show this. So I'm going to pull up Isotope Insight in multi-mono mode. And if you're not familiar with this in Pro Tools, basically instead of running this plugin as a single stereo plugin, I'm now running it as two mono plugins, one in the left, one in the right. And initially they default to being linked, but now I can see them separately. The reason I'm doing this is because when I put Insight on the master fader or something here, it's going to sum the two tracks beforehand. So if I look at the stereo version of this, we're gonna see the comb filtering, whether it's actually happening or not. She told me one day she would love me. So it's hard to see without looking at pink noise, but we can see there's a little bit of that pattern of peak trough, peak trough, peak trough. She told me one day she would love me. However, when I go back to the mono version, she told me one day she you can see those troughs are not near as aggressive. Now, let's look at what happens when I pan the delayed version on top. She told me one day she would love me. She told me one day she would love me. She told me one day she would love me. So again, we're getting a little bit of a boost. We're also getting those dips there. And that pattern of peak, dip, peak, dip, peak, dip that's happening across the frequency domain is the reason why we call this comb filtering. Um, in this scaling where we're looking at frequency scaled logarithmically, we tend to see those getting closer together. If we actually mapped this out linearly, that's where we start to see that peak trough, peak trough that all has equal widths, which is where the name comes from. Long story short, at this stage, when we're doing this delayed uh, this short delay trick. We are always going to hard pan the two tracks. And once we've made the decision to do that, we control stereo position, not with our pan pots, but with the delay time and by creating some interchannel amplitude differences. So for example, I could combine time interchannel time differences with interchannel amplitude differences. And let's do this. We'll go back to a shorter delay time. So right now this should be panned soft left with a little bit of stereo width. She told me one day she would love me as much as she And again, if I wanted a little closer to the center, I shortened my delay time. She told me one day she would love me. Or if I want her a little more off to the left, I increase it a little bit. She told me one day she would love me. Now one of the other things that I can do is create some interchannel amplitude differences in combination with this. So what I'm going to do is take that same delay time, which should be skewing her off to the left a little bit with a little bit of stereo width, and I'm going to collapse a little bit of that stereo width by turning down the delayed version over to the right. She told me one day she would love me as much as she loves her black iced coffee. And now we might be getting an effect more like what we would have gotten had we recorded her voice with say an ORTF pair, where we're gonna have both interchannel amplitude and interchannel time differences. So basically controlling the interchannel amplitude and time differences once we've set up this way comes down to controlling this. Now, generally speaking, we do not make the delayed version louder. We know that the Haas effect tells us that we can. However, it tends to be a losing battle. 
And the problem with that is what happens is now we get a really inconsistent listening experience for people that are sitting outside of the sweet spot. And while we would certainly never do that because we're all really great audio engineers and we know how important it is to sit in the sweet spot, the reality is the vast majority of listeners out there don't immediately position themselves equidistant from the two speakers in a way that gives us the most accurate stereo rendering. So if I turn the delayed version up, inevitably what I get is a mix that steers her voice a little closer to the middle, right? Because we've got interchannel time differences that should skew us to the left. But as I bump up the right volume, it's gonna steer that back a little bit towards the middle. But if I'm off center a little bit to the right, the vocals are just gonna seem too loud. And if I'm off center a little bit to the left, the vocals are gonna seem a little undermixed. So to avoid that problem, we generally wanna keep this at unity gain or below on the delayed channel. Let's play with that just to see what happens. She told me one day she would love me As much as she loves her black iced coffee But I... Now, with that set the way it is, I'm going to encourage you to actually do something we don't normally do a lot of when we're doing our critical listening. I'm going to encourage you to actually move off to the left and to the right and notice how her voice gets louder or quieter. She told me one day she would love me As much as she loves her black iced coffee But I cannot wait until I am cool enough Cause baby I've decided I'm free all right, so let's do one last test. We know that the Haas limit tells us that in theory, this delayed version should actually stay off. We should hear the undelayed version predominating our sense of location until this gets somewhere close to 10 dB hotter. So I'm gonna start bringing this channel up. Remember this is post fader, so we've already got our 4.7 dB boost. This 4.3 is on top of that. I'm gonna bring this up and as we approach plus 10 dB. My guess is that that's going to be the point where you will start to hear the vocals come back to the center and then actually maybe even cross a little over to the right. She told me one day she would love me as much as she loves her black iced coffee. But I cannot wait until I am cool enough. Cause baby, I've decided I'm forever hot. Now, at that point, we've radically unbalanced the vocal mix in a way that, like I say, is completely unnatural. That isn't something that would happen in the real world with a spaced pair. And like I say, from a practical standpoint, we've created a problem for ourselves in unbalancing our mix. So as a general rule, like I say, when we are working with these very short delay times, we keep them hard panned and we do not boost the delayed version louder than the undelayed version. If we do anything, we attenuate the delayed version to control the panning. And again, if I wanted her to be over on the right, I just swap which one is delayed and which one isn't. She told me one day she would love me as much as she loves her. So it's a quick demo of how we end up working with this stuff. Um, like I say, we could, there's nothing that says, you know, if I soft pan these left and right and it sounds good, that that's a problem. However, at this point, that is creating a timbre change at the same time that we're dealing with stereo imaging. Two very different processes. And for now, we want to disentangle those processes, separate them one from another so that we can start focusing on just crafting a sound stage, being able to make changes to our sound stage without having a lot of timbral artifacts that also come with it. Um, that's just adding more complexity that is more than we want to be managing at this point. So the last thing that we want to think about when we're thinking about our sound stage is the distance or proximity from these sound sources. And if we haven't gotten that far in critical listening yet this semester, let me be the first to introduce or maybe the second to introduce the idea that our perception of distance in recording is fundamentally related to timbral detail. What this means is that there are some low-level frequency components 
that will drop below our threshold of detection. If we pull up eyes or uh, insight here and we can start looking at this, what we're talking about are these low level energy components that are down here, not at the peaks up here spectrally, but the ones that are down there. And as we move back from a source, we know that due to the inverse square law that we talk about in acoustics and psychoacoustics, that the sound overall is going to get quieter. As we move back, we will reach a key distance in which some of those timbral details drop below our threshold of perception, our, de our ability to detect them. And when those timbral details go away, that's the underlying effect that tells us that the sound is farther away. If we hear those timbral details, it sounds close to us. If we don't hear those timbral details, it sounds farther away. So this is one of the reasons why in the recording studio world, we have a tendency to mic a little closer to the sound source rather than necessarily miking farther away. It's easier for me to capture some of those timbral details and then to try and get rid of them later rather than to not capture them at a very good level and to have to try and accentuate them later. In fact, it as a general rule, if the microphone didn't capture those timbral details, there's nothing I can do later on to recreate those timbral details. So generally speaking, the way we're gonna control distance on our sound stage is with equalization by intentionally attenuating certain frequency ranges very selectively based upon where we're hearing those timbral details. Now, an important thing to understand and a myth that has taken a, a, an unpleasant amount of, of root into the world of the audio community is the idea that if we take out the highs, it will make things sound farther away. That is absolutely not true in any practical real sense of the word. For sound to be attenuative, at higher frequencies, we need to be a great distance away. If we're at the other end of a football stadium, yes, the air between the sound source and our listener or our microphone has in fact attenuated the high frequencies more than they have low frequencies. But we're generally in a recording not creating an experience where the sound source sounds like it's on the other side of a football stadium. We're talking about a distance of five or 10 feet and air is not measurably more absorptive in the high frequency ranges over a distance of five feet. It's just not. The physics of that doesn't actually hold up. The frequency range where that timbral detail can happen can be anywhere. It simply is where it is. So the important thing that we wanna understand is we have to listen critically, evaluate within the frequency spectrum where we're hearing those timbral details, and then work with an EQ to take out those timbral details. They could be in the low mids, they could be in the mid uppers, they could be in the highs, they could be in the lows, they could be anywhere. They simply are where they are. And you can abstract and try and say, well, the high frequencies should attenuate more. No, like I say, at real world practical different distances that we're working with when we're crafting a sound stage, that's not really a factor. If you're working in film and you're trying to create a sound effect that sounds, that matches a picture and the picture has the sound source three, four, five, six hundred feet away, yes, taking out high frequencies will help to uh, accomplish that orally. However, when we're mixing music, like I say, there's never a time in my entire career that I've been mixing a sound source and thought, you know, I want this sound to be one and a half feet away from me, and I want this other sound to be 500 feet away from me. It's just not something that comes up when we're practically sound staging. So, generally speaking, we aren't worried about just attenuating the high end. That's not the practical way to make something sound far away. It makes it to, in order to be effective, it has to sound way far away for that approach to be effective. We just need to listen, identify where the key timbral details are, and then attenuate those until they drop below our threshold of detection, or we listen to the sound source, identify how far we think it is away from us. We start initially with three main areas that will judge this is the sound within our immediate proximity. And the way we usually define this is, do you feel like you could reach out and touch it? Is the sound so close that I could put my arm out and touch the sound source? Or is it a little beyond that? Is it close, but not so close that I can touch it, right? And we have a range that fits into that category. Then we have a range that we'll think about starting like way at the other end of a big room. 
And initially, when we're trying to judge how close a sound source is, that should be our initial question. Does it sound like it's kind of on the other end of a big room from us? Does it sound like it's in the same room, but outside of our immediate distance? I can't reach out and touch it, but it's not way far away. Or does it sound so close that I could reach out and touch this thing? Within that, we of course have a lot of varying distances. But initially when we're listening for that, that's the question that we want to be asking is, which of those three spaces is it? Is it kind of way on the other side of the room? Is it in the same room with us, relatively close by, but not so close that I could touch it? Or is it so close that I could reach out and touch this sound source? So, Again, when we start working with this, because this is happening in the frequency domain, we're generally going to be working with EQs and filters to control the distance of our sound sources. And one of the things that we want to think about at this point is what's a reasonable aesthetic? Why would we choose to do one of these things over another? As we start listening to mixes and as you're working in critical listening, one of the things that I hope you notice is that most of the mixes that we think of as good mixes that we tend to enjoy generally have a mixture of moderately narrow sound objects and moderately wide sound objects. In other words, one of the things that I think about when I'm coming up with a sound stage diagram or deciding how I want to sound stage my tracks, I start thinking, what sound sources do I want to be a little wider? What ones do I want to be a little narrower? And why? What's a logical reason for that, right? Is it based on a spatial conception that I want something to sound very, very close to me and because of that I want it to have some width? I want it to feel like it's occupying a larger portion of my spatial perception because it's closer to me? Or do I want the thing that's closer to me maybe to be a little narrow and I want to widen out some of the things in the background because sometimes it becomes a little more difficult to localize them, which can change our perception. What sounds do I want to be very close to me? What sounds do I want to be farther away? Commonly, we might think about how a band would set up on stage. So we might think, hey, we want the lead singer to be the closest thing to us. Maybe the next closest things would be the guitar and bass, and then the drums are going to be a little bit upstage. And that's a very practical and reasonable way that we might think about crafting a sound stage. Interestingly, when we listen to a lot of modern mixes, it's actually very much the opposite of that. Not only do we hear a lot of stereo panning for a drum kit that matches drummer perspective, but the nature of the proximity is often kind of what the drummer would hear. In other words, we hear drums with a lot of timbral detail that kind of make them the closest thing to us. Vocals might be the next thing, and then the guitars and bass are a little farther back. Again, there's a lot of mixes that are done that way. There isn't one inherently right or wrong way. There are various aesthetics, and we, on a particular project, or really on a part of a particular project, on a portion of a particular song, we decide which one is going to be the best in helping us as mixers to realize the artistic intentions, the creative intentions, and the semantic intentions, the 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 meaning the, the creation and conveying of meaning in the mix. So that's where we'll wrap up for today. Um, again, I apologize for having to have you watch this video out of time. Um, we'll jump back in in class and pick up from here. So have a nice day.